everyone come and grab a seat. We're going to start with the last speaker of this morning. And before I introduce him, who has ever heard of the concept of music and beer pairing? Anyone? No? <laughs> I, I, there's at least one or two people. <laughs> I didn't until I looked look up. Um, and so, believe it or not, they are the inventor of it, <laughs> or the co-inventor, may we say. And so it's the art of pairing one unique song with one unique beer. It's a complex science, but they surely master it. <laughs> and apart from doing that, Luke is a product leader, they're um, an illustrator, and so many other things. Um, but we're very happy to have them. And right now, they lead the design advocacy team at Zero Heights, and they're passionate about inclusivity, and that's what they came to talk to us about. Thank you so much for coming here, Luke. Welcome on stage, Luke Murphy. Hello. Oh, look at that. It's nice and big. Yeah, if anybody wants to catch me at the end of today, uh, we can set up a little beer and music pairing station. Sounds, sounds like it'd be a good thing. Um, so, hi, I'm Luke. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. Uh, and I work at Zero Heights, which is the design system management platform that only cool people use. That is a fact. Uh, if you use another one, I'll come out back later and I'll fight you. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, uh, the best place is probably on Twitter, even though it is a hellhole and I refuse to call it X. Um, I'm at LurkMoofy there, or officially you can get me at Zero Height. Uh, to be fair, you can probably find me at LurkMoofy pretty much anywhere on the internet. Um, we also have a Slack community at Zero Height if you want to get involved there. Uh, ZeroHeight.com slash Slack. Very easy to remember, but if you don't remember that, then I did tweet it earlier today, so you can find the link there and you can come and chat to us there. So, this is me. Uh, I was born in Australia way back in the last millennium. I grew up in a suburb of Sydney called Blacktown, about an hour west of the famous landmarks that you probably know and love, like the Sydney Opera House and the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Uh, it was called Blacktown because it was the first civilized settlement of indigenous Australians. Um, which it only took me until I was in my mid-twenties to unpack the blatant racism and colonialism involved in that. Uh, but that's a bit of a side point. I had a relatively safe middle-class upbringing. I played video games. I gave myself concussion riding a skateboard. I had awful taste in music that mostly consisted of new metal and cheesy R&B. Um, around my teenage years, I started to realize that I didn't feel particularly comfortable in my own skin. Uh, much like a lot of teenagers. Uh, the traditional markers of what a boy should like never felt natural to me. Sports never stuck with me for more than a couple years, naturally gravitated towards things like softball and netball than I did to things like footy or cricket, like good Australian boys. Uh, I also found myself gravitating towards a group of girls as friends, much more interested in what they were talking about rather than the overtly blokey groups of the boys, where social interaction usually involved a ball and displays of competitive violence. Uh, academically, I naturally slipped in and excelled in subjects like art and drama and English and food tech, and always struggled with things like maths and science. Now, I didn't really care about this. I didn't care about the whole what boys should like even if it took a good 10 or 15 years later for me to learn what the gender binary was and how bullshit it was, um, I was just happy living my own little existence. But Jesus Christ, did my classmates notice? Uh, and it was decided that because of all these things I just mentioned and the fact that I didn't fit into their mold of what a boy should like, I needed a new label. Devastating, right? Uh, well, I mean, knowing what I know about myself today, not really. But in the context of the late 90s in suburban Australia, tiny little Luke felt differently. Because this wasn't just an observation, a keen observation, on who I was based on some ill-informed gender stereotypes, but it was an insult. It was a way of saying that I was less than them. 
because I didn't fit, fit their stereotypes of what I should be and what was normal, that someone like me was different. But not different in a good, we are all unique, beautiful snowflakes way, but as an other. An other that was rooted in a fear of difference. This was the start of an internalized homophobia that meant I would refuse to publicly acknowledge my sexuality or gender identity until way later in life, well into my 30s. Othering caused me to feel uncomfortable enough to closet myself and mask my identity as a queer, non-binary person because of what other people might think. Now, what do I mean when I say othering? So othering relates to this philosophical concept of the other, which is the idea that there is a self, which is what you know, and there is the other, which is different. And Husserl was one of the, the first to apply this concept to intersubjectivity or how we relate to other people. And it was from here that the concept of the other as a radical threat to the self was formed. And it makes sense. The self is what we know. It's what we understand. The other is different. It is unknown and so therefore can be a threat. And the term othering describes the reductive action of labeling and defining a person as a subaltern, which is another philosophical concept. So someone who belongs to the socially subordinate category of the other. It's about labeling someone as different from the norm and therefore in the margins of society, which is where we get the term marginalized from. And why does society do this? It's to prop up the existing systems of power. It makes the dominant systems more powerful because labeling something as other is to say that it is lesser in an attempt to diminish personal, social status and political power. It's to displace the othered community so that they can only operate in the margins of society. And it's a concept that's popped up by the binary. And fuck me, do humans love binaries. We use binaries for everything because it's an easy way of identifying what is relatable, i.e. the self or the plural self, and what isn't, the other. Male or female, straight or gay, white or black, rich or poor, able-bodied or disabled. These are all common binaries that also historically carry with them a kind of understanding that one is superior to the other, even though it's not. Uh, one is the norm and one is the other. One is the privileged, one is the disadvantaged. Interestingly, all of these also aren't binary, but anyway, we'll get to that. So what does this all have to do with design systems? That's what I'm up here talking about. So in my teen years, by having those insults thrown at me, I was labeled other in a pretty blatant, open way. But actually, that process of teaching me that I was not normal was a lot deeper and systemic than that. And to be honest, what caused those dickheads to try and hurt me by labeling me something uh, uh, that, that was meant to insult me, calling me gay, was a taught homophobia. Othering is built into our systems. The language we use, mankind, manpower, Chairman, man-made, fellowship, forefathers, all assume a dominant male gender. Man up, wearing the pants in the relationship, or alternatively, running like a girl, or boys don't cry. These are idioms that reinforce gender stereotypes for pretty much no reason. Uh, the fact that sometimes we still put female before something like CEO or lawyer because we assume the default is male? or uh, my personal favorite, being big into music, female-fronted as a genre, uh, which is great. Uh, the way we symbolize things, toilet signs, the two genders, skirt-wearing and naked. <laughs> so actually, if you just you know, uh, amuse me for a second, let's just take a quick def uh, detour into the two genders. Uh, we've got uh, fancy hat-wearing and bowler hat-wearing. It's pretty good. Uh, penis and Cyclops. Uh, shy and oh, I really need a piss. Uh, um, conversationally stunted and verbal diarrhea. Thought that one was quite good. I mean, this is definitely a binary, coffee or wine, right? 
uh, cats and chickens? I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> and to be honest, this shit starts early, like blue and pink everything for kids, right? Because you better conform from day one to society's expectations of you. Uh, fun fact, pink was actually a boy's color up until the 1950s, which kind of makes sense because, you know, color theory. Pink comes from red, which is a strong, aggressive, assertive color. It kind of plays into our gender stereotypes, whereas blue is calm. I don't know why they flipped it. It was probably advertising. Advertising has a lot to answer for, for pretty much everything. Um, even the language we use for children. So when my son was five, he developed close friendships with a young boy and a young girl. His friendship with the girl prompted common phrases like, Ooh, is that your girlfriend? Oh, they're going to go and get, they're going to get married someday, aren't they? Are you going to kiss your girlfriend? Aren't they cute together? Whereas all of the conversations around the boy, it was, oh, they're such troublemakers together. They play you so well together. Focus on the action, weirdly. Especially at the moment with all the talk of things like drag queens reading stories to children or the concept of accepting a young teen's pronoun usage as unnecessarily sexualizing children. Oh, honey, we've been doing this for years. It's just that we've been sexualizing them in a way that's seen as normal and ex exists in your preconceived ideas of what's normal. Our world enforces binaries. It enforces exclusion. I mean, Jesus, even the word heteronormative has normal in it. It's basically still saying that one is default and one is the other. So what I'm trying to say here is that these things are systemic which is why, it's not uh, why it is important to not place blame or hate on individual people acting within these systems, necessarily. Uh, unless someone is actively being a dick, then please place hate on them. Um, we just need to recognize these things and start to unpick the world one stitch at a time, which is where we come in as designers. Because it's our choice whether we design experiences that support these othering systems or attempt to rewrite them. Especially when we consider that the products we design are more often than not being used by millions of people a day. I mean, we saw before Booking.com being used by 200 million, over 200 million a day, was it? Um, the impact is real. And before I get into the nitty gritty and give some actual real world examples, which is probably what you're waiting for, uh, there's a really important thing that we all need to do first. We need to question where we came from. Now, like you guys, I built up a whole bunch of knowledge from some amazing sources. Things like Joseph Muller Brookman with the grid systems, or uh, Ernst Keller with Swiss design movement, or even more modern ones for today. You know, we have responsive web design from Ethan Marcotte, or 10 usability heuristics for user interface design from, from Jacob Nielsen, to my personal favorite, atomic design from Brad, Fro is Brad, Brad here? Hi, Brad. Yeah. Um, now, I don't want to detract from any of these highly influential and often game-changing foundational concepts and texts. Like, I will give credit where credit is due. These are all fantastic, and they really shaped what I do. But if we look at all these authors, all these very smart people who have shaped the UI design we do today, there's some strong shared characteristics across all of them. Cis male, white, able-bodied, straight. Now, that's no failing on them as individuals at all, but it's important to acknowledge that our foundations come from a position of power, from dominant forces in society. An acknowledgement of this means that we can question our foundations and make sure that we're not doing things that are propping up these existing systems that other people. Uh, if, you're more in, if you're interested in that, especially on the racial aspect of it, I highly recommend rec uh, checking out my colleague Michelle Chin's talk on decolonizing design systems. Uh, it was done at Converge this year, uh, which I think the videos are going online maybe later this week. Sometime soon. Check that out. But, Luke, how can a button be homophobic? <laughs> how does my form field make you feel less of a person? Well, surprisingly, yeah, it can. Although, I do have to say that it's usually not in the components themselves, but more in the patterns and how they're put together. Things like guidelines and principles that guide what we do, that it is in the individual elements themselves. And these usually break down to three main things. There's the language we use, there's the defaults we use, 
and representation. So let's start with really nice, easy ones that pretty much all products use. Form fields. And let's start with one piece of data that for some reason a lot of people want to know, gender. Oh, this one's a fun one. So just to get on the right page, because gender is a weirdly controversial thing right now, let's start with some facts. What I'm talking about when I say the word gender, it's a defined set of uh, norms, behaviors, and roles that vary between societies and over time. Gender is often categorized as male, female, or a whole bunch of other non-binary terms, which is different to gender identity, which is one's own internal sense of self and their gender, whether that is man, woman, neither, or both. Unlike gender expression, gender identity is not outwardly visible to other people. For some people, gender identity aligns with the sex assigned that, they're, that they are assigned at birth. And for transgender people, gender identity differs in varying degrees from the sex assigned at birth. And then gender expression that I mentioned before is how a person presents gender outwardly through behavior, clothing, voice, perceived characteristics, bunch of different perceived characteristics. Society identifies these cues as usually masculine or feminine, although what is considered masculine or feminine changes completely over time and depending on culture and place. So in other words, gender is very complicated. Uh, here's a list of 50 different gender identities that someone can identify as. And this list, list isn't even exhaustive. There's, there's more. Uh, gender is a very individual fluid thing. If you're interested in that, highly recommend this book. Uh, I've actually got my copy, uh, which you can come and see me at the Zero Height stand and, and have a flick through. It's very good. Anyway, 50, 50 genders. Uh, here's what we usually reduce it to. Or, if we're lucky, oh, yeah. Um, now, there's a few things to point out here. First off, uh, fuck that binary male, female, uh, but even if we're talking about biological sex, sex is not binary. 1.7% of the US population is intersex, which means that they share, both a they share a combination of both male and female biological traits. Now, 1.7% feels quite small. That's 5.64 million people in the US that this applies to. That's one and a half Berlins, So, just to give you context. And even then, Studies are now coming out that show that, genetically speaking, sex is a spectrum anyway. The markers that we think of of XX and XY are just the start of what makes up our biological sex. It's a great infographic from Scientific American showing some of the intricacies of that. So it's not that simple. But let's go back to that other example that I had before, the, the slightly better one. So gender binary useless, we know that. So let's, let's put in the other option. Ah, but I mentioned othering before, right? So we're literally othering anybody who doesn't identify with that binary. As a non-binary person, that sends me a clear signal that I am not welcome here. A small tweak in the language used would help here, not listed here with an optional field or something else, uh, which is still a little bit othering, uh, but still keeps it open. Or how about just non-binary, because even though non-binary is its own gender identity, it also literally in the name says that I'm not part of the binary, um, which is better than other. Um, and this, uh, next up, let's look at the defaults that we're using in these form fields. So the ordering, maybe? Far too often I see this. Uh, male, female, and then other unspecified. Enter your own thing here. Uh, I don't know about you and the way that you were taught the alphabet, but I'm pretty sure that F comes before M. Um, so I'd really love to hear the arguments that are used to mean that you'd put male before female uh, that aren't just around the fact that male is default and you probably didn't think about it. Uh, you could argue that it's about data uh, and that males make up the majority of your audience, but it's a pretty weak argument because you're reinforcing broken systems and when it comes down to it, 51% of the world's population are women. So it probably shouldn't be that clear cut unless you're selling erectile dysfunction medicine and then it <laughs> might make more sense I don't know, still, do it alphabetically if you can. Well, better yet, don't make it a limited option. Make it an open text field, or an open text field with lots of options that autocomplete. But what about data cleanliness? 
If we allow people to put in whatever they want into that field, how are we going to process that data? Someone might identify as a table, and it will ruin everything. How will we cope? Well, first off, you can probably do a quick Google search and get an exhaustive list of genders that will help you, you know, match things up in the back end. Um, or if you need to simplify things in the back end just to make your data cleaner, that's fine. Just don't present it to the user, please, please. Um, even then, you might want to ask why you're segmenting people. But anyway, um, also in our world of AI, I mean, just feed this into a, an LLM like GPT, and it'll help you clean that data up in a flash. Um, so you know that excuse can fuck off. Um, but the big important question after that is, do, do you need to know the user's gender? Why are you asking this information in the first place? Is it important? What's it used for? Most of the time, it's to do with demographics, in which case, actually getting the best representation of your user is probably going to help you, you know, not making reductive assumptions by limiting the choice. If it's to actively alter the experience for the user, then question whether that's actually a good idea, uh, or whether you're you know, limiting their experience based on, again, assumptions that you're making about them. And if it's because you actually need to know for your product, um, then, hey, why don't you actually ask the question that you need to know? Do you have a penis? Um, I don't know why you'd be asking that, but there are a lot of products out there. Um, uh, do you wear skirts? I quite enjoy a skirt from time to time. So, you know, I would like to be included in that. And none of these questions necessarily mean you neatly fit into male or female anyway. Okay, so that's just the gender field. Let's get on to another field, another fun one. Uh, title. Um, that's enough, right? Mr., Mrs., and Ms. Um, but it's just a title. What does it matter? I mean, well, I can tell you that uh, whenever this happens to me, again, as a non-binary person, I have a little bit of a cry inside, uh, not just because I listened to too much My Chemical Romance as a child, but, um, but it's because it's, it's kind of erasing my identity. It's telling me that my chosen identity isn't valid or relevant enough to be provided as an option, which, you know, it hurts, and it marginalizes me further. So thanks, Ryanair. Um, but why do we need titles anyway? Aren't they outdated? Like, do we really need this many titles? Um, I also, re I know it's Fortnum and Mason, but how many her slash his royal highnesses do they have using their website? Um, anyway, um, what do we even use them for? It's mostly just for addressing people, right? So, uh, or it might be a marker that this person is married or not married, but only if you're female. Um, so really, we can probably just put them in the bin? Yeah? Except... Um, so when I researched this for uh, a, a, an excellent podcast that I was a guest on called Systems of Harm, which is where I stole the title of this talk from, thanks Amy Hoop, um, I assumed that, yeah, titles are stupid, get rid of them, what's the point? Um, but in my research, I realized that I was discounting whole groups of people uh, for my own benefit. And there are people out there who have worked against the odds for their title. Doctors, professors, Priests, I don't know. Um, especially folks from underrepresented under communities in those roles who have fought against the odds to gain those titles. Getting rid of it might be a subtle way of erasing their achievements or their identity. So it's not simple and binary. Ooh, surprise. Um, it's more complex than that. But similar to the above, if you, need to, if you need to or want to include title fields, make them optional and ideally make them open and non-restrictive. And please, just don't put Mr. first. That's the important one. Uh, but it's not just the form fields. I mentioned categorization before. Uh, this is one that is especially prevalent in e-commerce. Does anybody here work in e-commerce? There's a few. I'm hoping that I'm not going to offend you now. Um, especially, it feels like anything that has to do with bodies. Um, so clothing, uh, women and men. Uh, we have... Uh, Healthcare, skincare. Um, I don't know why you need a whole section for men here, apart from the fact that, I don't know, they want to make it smell like locker rooms and trauma. 
Um, but it's not just things to do with your bodies either, toys. Although, luckily, I was trying to find an example online of this, and most toy shops, online toy retailers have fixed this, which is good. But, um, but I mean this, because it's only boys who can play with Lego, right? Uh, it's awful. Um, and I don't know about you, but so my, my partner, who is assigned female at birth, uh, lives in men's T-shirts. Um, I personally... I'm a big fan of leggings, especially in winter. Leggings and a big jumper, oh, it's the best. Men's toiletries and skincare, as I mentioned, it's, you know, basically the women's stuff is way better anyway, and I've been using that since I was a teenager. It's all, all dog shit. Um, it's all a bit ridiculous and a bit reductive to just put these into arbitrary categories. And we, as the designers designing these experiences, kind of suck with not putting these into arbitrary categories. Uh, most women, uh, most websites delineate between men and women as the two options, and we are getting better at this. So there are attempts to kind of get away with this, especially in clothing, to show sort of gender-neutral uh, ways of doing it. Interestingly, on this, uh, they have a what is basically a, a content-driven gender-neutral section on the Adidas site, uh, but all of these individual items only exist in men or women's on the website. But anyway. Uh, we're getting there. We're getting closer, which is good. Um, but basically, a lot of this is because the systems that they're built on don't support having more than one approach. So it's too rigid. And a lot of this usually comes down to just representation. It's about being seen to be valued. Um, to be fair, as I said, it's been getting a lot better. Uh, not only are we seeing realistically diverse representations of people uh, on, on the internet, but it's actively being talked about when we're designing too, which is great. And this is important to enshrine at a systems level. Uh, make sure that representing a diverse range of people is enshrined in your principles and guidelines within your design system, in your copy guidelines, in your illustration guidelines, in your photography guidelines. And when you're doing illustration guidelines, uh, blue people doesn't mean that it covers everyone, just as a note. Um, and as well as system things like I talked about, like defaults and placeholders as well. Make sure that you, you know, you've got a diverse representation there. It might feel like a small thing that I'm talking about here, representation. And we do hear complaints about work culture taking over everything, but I'll let you in on a little secret. Uh, diverse people have existed for a really long time. Um, and it's only because of representation and normalizing that they feel comfortable enough to be seen and heard. Um, I know that was definitely the case for me. It was representation that meant that I felt more comfortable in coming out, even though it was very, very late in my life. And while we're talking about representation, let's take it back to a fundamental level. Unfortunately, most design system teams that I meet look like this. Um, Amy, who I mentioned before, uh, has a great anecdote about one um, amazing design system team uh, that she worked on, where she was, as a woman, outnumbered four to one by men called Matt. Um, it's a bit sad. Uh, one of the best ways to make sure that you have diversity represented in your product and in your system is by having diverse voices involved in building it. And diverse hiring isn't just a checklist. It's, it's something that truly makes your product better because you have diverse experiences, diverse cultures, diverse points of view contributing to what you're doing. Basically, you're building your product with a team that better reflects the world that is going to use your product. If you want to talk about good diverse hiring practices, please come and grab me afterwards. I could do a whole talk on it uh, of things that I found have worked and haven't worked. Um, but I'm wrapping up towards the end now. I've got two and a half minutes left. Uh, I've already mentioned Amy quite a few times, but if you, if you want to hear more in depth about what I've been talking about today, uh, I highly recommend going and checking out this podcast called Systems of Harm. Um, my conversation with her about trans exclusion was what inspired me to do this talk. Uh, also, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants uh, that weirdly aren't white men. Um, I also recommend going and watching Tatiana Mack's talk on System of Systems from Clarity in 2019. It's free on the internet. You can go and check it out. Um, really good. Delves into how the systems that we work within, um, the systems that we do work within systems or broader systems of privilege and harm. I've just said systems way too many times at once. So all these suggestions for ways to improve the way that we design that I've been talking about are about questioning our perceived knowledge, questioning and challenging normativity. 
It's just about looking at what we do and asking whether it's the best way to do things, especially when looking through the lens of inclusivity and intersectionality. And there's another word for this. It's queering. For those who don't know, queer is a word that is used to describe something or someone that rejects binarism and normativity and a lack of intersectionality. Because the reality is we are all very complex human beings and we all live outside of binaries. We exist in multiple boxes. We all exist on a wonderful spectrum of the world. And defaults are boring. So if I can leave you with a few things, defaults can get in the bin. Uh, fuck the binary. And it's time to queer our systems and make the things that we build a more inclusive place. Dankeschön. Thank you, Luke. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this topic. I feel that we never ask ourselves these questions enough. In fact, I don't even remember the last time we had a discussion about inclusivity in my design team. Um, so thanks. It's uh, 1 p.m. We're going to do a 10 minutes Q&A, but people online, there are interactive sessions starting right now. So uh, feel free to go or stay with us for the Q&A. We have around 10 minutes, and I think there's a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> so let's yeah. get it to uh, the first one. Now that we have Gen AI being trained by humans, how do we ensure the biases aren't, oh, it went down. Yes. <laughs> aren't inherently programmed in. Do you know of any company actively doing this? Kind of. Um, so, so first off, uh, it goes back to my point around making sure that you have those diverse voices. Uh, if you don't have those diverse voices in your team, then make sure that when you're doing user research, you're bringing in people who aren't reflected in your team. It's very important. Um, I'm very excited about generative AI. Uh, and I think it goes back to what and I, I feel awful because I can't remember his name, but um, the cool dude from yeah, booking.com. Sure. Yes. Yeah, sure. um, uh, talking about uh, prompt engineering. Um, so when it comes to generative AI, uh, one of the most important things, you're working, the, the data sets are kind of hidden, which is a bad thing, so you kind of can't see what's informing it, but you can train it and prompt it to give you the things that, that you need with prompt engineering. Um, there's a really great uh, talk, I think it's, on, from Clarity? Uh, they did it at Design Matters last week in Copenhagen, but the Duolingo Max folks uh, gave a talk about, so it's not specifically around inclusivity, but they talked about how they trained the Duolingo Max AI um, uh, conversational partner that they have um, to make sure that it was doing what they needed. Now, if you do that through that intersectional inclusive lens, then you should be able to help train it away from harm. It is a big area, though. There's so many ethical and moral quandaries around generative AI. I think part of it is especially queer folks and, well, to be honest, just any underrepresented folks. Um, tool up on it. Like, educate yourself around AI and get involved in it because if those voices aren't there to help shape what we do with generative AI, it is probably going to turn into a shit show, which, to be fair, it already kind of has in some parts. <laughs> yes, definitely. All right, uh, on the more positive side, which companies <laughs> can we watch for best practices? Who is crushing it, basically? Um, oh, I kind of hate to say this, because they are a trash fire, but um, Meta? Oh, <laughs> it's, um, although I think that there was some recent, I need to tool up on the news, I've been very busy, but I know there was some recent stuff about big social media platforms um, removing uh, like trans, trans um, safety measures uh, for, for trans folks. Um, so, but I know that from a UI and UX point of view, Meta are actually pretty good with the way that they do it. They're pretty inclusive. Um, a lot of the way that they design things are designed with a very broad spectrum of people in mind, and they did at least have safeguarding measures. I know Twitter definitely don't anymore, thanks Elon. Um, but, um, but yeah, I think Meta are a pretty good one. Um, oh, I'll find some better ones and share mm. them with you. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's probably not that many. Uh, yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. All right, the next one is a bit tricky to understand. <laughs> How to move forward, being exclusive, showing as many possibilities as possibility, or ease of use and familiarity? Yeah. 
Can't have a drop down with everything. <laughs> it's true. Um, I actually, this is why I really like that um, the the meta example I showed with gender fields. I mean, it was quite complicated in in what it was, but the concept behind it. We're designers. Part of our job is hiding complexity or making complexity seem simpler than it, than it is. Um, there are ways around these problems. Yes, providing a drop down with like. 50 different titles is a pretty shitty experience. Um, but that's why I was talking about things like autocomplete um, being quite good and having autocomplete that, that learns from itself. Um, or, you know, providing, providing prompts and, and defaults, um, providing prompts and inclusive defaults for people um, can be a good way to sort of start. But I think that's basically it. It's that challenge of, okay, look, this is not an easy problem to fix but let's figure out what the ideal solution is from an inclusivity point of view, and then let's sort of iterate on that and bring down the complexity so that it is usable uh, for people. Because if we make things that aren't usable, then um, other shittier experiences will probably dominate your experience. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they are very important. Mm -hmm. Now asking about <laughs> when we face wall outside of our design yeah. realm. <laughs> So within the fintech space, for example, gender is usually required for legal reasons. Yeah. How can we move f uh, toward change when faced with legal systems? Yeah, um, I think that this is, uh, it's a tough one. And I think that there are compromises that probably will be made. Um, and I think that part of it is being a voice for change within your organization and pushing up. Um, so I know that, for example, that that what I showed for Ryanair, although actually they're shittier than they need to be for legal reasons, but you know, they're an airline. They have to have very specific information to pass on to, to authorities. Um, it's what I was talking about though before where it's like you can probably hide in the complexity. <laughs> it's it's the, the, you can alter things in the back end to um, you know, comply to your regulations. Potentially, I don't. Well, I'm saying this with a massive caveat of I don't work in the fintech space, so you know, come and chat to me afterwards mm -hmm. if you want to educate me otherwise. But I think part of it is around like making the experience for the user very good, and then figuring out how you, as a team, can then comply in a regulation sort of point of view. Um, if you do have to do it, like if there's no other way around it, at least provide context to the user as to why you're doing it. Another big area that I usually put in this, but didn't have time to today, is around dead naming, uh, which is around the concept of using somebody's like previous legal name that they don't go by anymore. Uh, and this is a regulate like regulatory thing. So you know there are people who are trying to change this um, at like a, a government level, but um, but at the sort of meantime, sort of question why, and if you absolutely can't change it, provide information to the user as to why you need it and why it is important, and how that data will be used in the future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, talking about the value of working on this, how can we convince <laughs> your main stakeholders to invest resources in inclusive mm -hmm. and accessible design? If it doesn't have an impact or, on revenue, or if it does, how can we show it? Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, so like a combination of things. So there's, there's the one. If it, 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 the likelihood is that it will have an impact on your revenue because you're including more people and more people have money and that's what businesses care about, right? Um, so getting the data behind who you're excluding and therefore who you're excluding from using your product or why they would use your competitors. Uh, again, competitive research um, is you know really good. Showing if your competitors are doing it better than you, it means that they're including more people and therefore have a potential to have a better experience and have more users than you. Um, that's that's a good one. <sighs> Unfortunately, also part of this is that it is a it's a battle that quite often we need to fight um, because we care about it and because it's important and because we believe it's important and we believe that it's going to be important in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that it's one of those things where even if the stakeholders like are against it, just try and slip them in anyway <laughs> um, because you're ultimately making the experience better for people and that should ultimately affect the quality of your product and therefore sort of user numbers and bottom line metrics. Mm -hmm. Great. I think we have time for one last question. 
And there's a lot of curiosity around the gender drop-down. <laughs> so asking users a gender is definitely an issue, <laughs> but design systems task is to provide yeah. components. How can or should we influence the fact that this ask is a business requirement? <laughs> it's like three questions down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I think this is actually a really important one. This is a whole other talk. We've kind of got, with design systems, we've kind of got stuck on artifacts and components as being one of the main artifacts. One of the most important things with design systems is not the components themselves, but the patterns that go into defining how those components work. And I think that we as design system teams need to be moving more towards the pattern space and providing flexibility and constraints and guardrails for how our users are going to use the design system than we do crafting the perfectly crafted component. Um, so I think that that's one of the things is that like it's not just about the UI elements or the code that goes into the UI elements, but how that works is, is one of the most important things when it comes to design systems, but it's something that I think a lot of folks have forgotten. Uh, and so we need to get back to that place of actually where we're still building design system teams are building experiences. They're not building components. They're building patterns of usage. They're not building components. Um, again, if you want to fight me on that, I'm very happy to talk. Uh, so please come and chat to me. Great. Thank you so much, Luke. Thank you for bringing this topic to Hatch. And we hope hearing about it again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Hope I didn't bum you out too much. Thank you. Cheers.